Uh, Judy received her uh, BFA from the University of Colorado. Uh, she has an MFA from University of California, Berkeley, and she has shown very, very widely in places such as uh, MoMA PS1, the New Museum, the Drawing Center, the Parish, etc. She has a work in the Parish right now, and um, we will talk about that in a little bit. In 1982, she had an NEA grant, um, and she works out here, um, and um, we are really delighted to have you here, which I've probably said three times. I will now relax. So, we asked Judy if she would join us and be one of the artists participating in our show about boxing. And it was a really interesting conversation and studio visit because one of the things that Judy said to me was that um, you're not really interested in the, a, an idea of struggle between the sexes. You are interested in the freedom of women to behave badly and also the way of sort of men and women interacting. That is more, is primarily the focus of the work that you are doing now. Is that an accurate summing up of where you are? Yeah, well, the piece you chose for the boxing show is from a show. What do I do? There you go. Okay. Um, is from a show I did about clowns. And um, I was interested in clowns, not scary clowns at all. I was interested in them because they, um, I see them as artists. These, this particular genre of clowns with their makeup, their clothes. And I like the fact that they sort of, Judy, it's, it's, it's male clowns putting on makeup. So it's gender fluid. So there's already a setup of like sexual um, fluidity. But yeah, from a while back, I've been doing work that um, actually it's a contradiction, like you're saying. On one hand, um, I want to dispel the myth that men seek and women fend off. I like to have it that turned around and have the women be the transgressors, the women be the, and look at it that way. But I also, I'm a bit of a contradiction because I also enjoy the game of attraction, glamor, flirtation, um, using my body for power or seduction or whatever, but I also, you know, agree that, it, you know, women get dehumanized. So it's a, it's a contradiction. So which one? I don't know. And so, like in the clowns and the one you chose, they, they are sort of fighting, but in a, in a way that's um, somewhat playful, I guess, like seductive fighting and seducing at the same time. You have a very interesting um, choice in that work about what the gloves actually look like. Yeah, they're lobster claws. <laughs> so they're both humorous and slightly threatening. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. I, I love that image of lobster claws. <laughs> It goes back to Man Ray with his pet lobster. And also <laughs> Dali, great references. <laughs> so you have um, chosen a couple of images for us right. to look like, okay. look at. This is sort of um, takes, well, I always tell this story that um, I'm, I'm really a good girl and um, one day in my life, my husband just left and um, I just woke up and thought, well, being a good girl is not working for me. <laughs> and so, um, at least in my work, I'm gonna be a bad girl. <laughs> and um, so I started doing this series called, I had this urgency to do this subject matter. I was not a figurative painter at the time. So let's see. I started doing this series called Sex Advice Drawings, and um, what they were were 
this anachronistic um, thing from the where men wrote letters to the Playboy advisor saying, you know, how do I get my girlfriend or wife to do this? And how do I get them to do this? So, and the one that really got to me was, it said, how do I get my girlfriend to dress up as a chicken? <laughs> and I thought, really? All the stuff that we do <laughs> to please men, and now we have to dress up like a chicken? And they didn't even say in response, forget it. They said, um, therapy. They said, uh, we'll start with a kitty cat or a bunny. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I did this thing where I decided to make the letters come from the woman to the man. And you know, maybe that would somehow um, demonstrate uh, yeah, w women aren't always there to be compliant. Maybe we have desires too. Maybe we have needs or I don't know, whatever. It's a, it's a b feminism in the bedroom. So this was one that I did. Okay, it says, I have to... It says, Dear Playboy Advisor, ever since my husband started collecting art, he spends all his time staring at his Jasper Johns. How do I get his attention? <laughs> and here's one that I have over there. I redid it, because this one, I mean, I must say, sex sells. Um, <laughs> I, I've done this painting many times, and it, it hits so many buttons that, um, it's, you know, this Gauguin, um, the spirit of the dead watching, no, the spirit of the night watching. watching. In the painting, there's a figure of a, um, sort of a dark figure in the background. So this, this poor woman is really um, prey. I mean, I've never seen a, a painting that she's, the woman is so, pr look like prey, but at least he cops to it with the, the spirit of the dead watching. I sort of love the painting, sorry, Sherry. <laughs> but um, I mean, I know Gauguin did fetishize exoticism and women and was not a good guy, but- And he, young women. This I, and young women, but I do love his work. I have to, I, this is the contradiction I was talking about before. Anyway, this one says, dear Playboy advisor, my husband only wants to do it in the back door. He says it's more mysterious. Do you think he's gay? And it says, E.F. from Boise, Montana. Dear E.F., everybody's gay. <laughs> At some point in our culture, I don't know whether anybody else experienced this, but everybody started saying, well, he's gay, he's gay, he's gay. Al Pacino's gay. Tom Cruise is gay. Abraham Lincoln's gay. <laughs> everybody's gay. I'm not really, okay. Maybe. So not only women are, like, rejected because they're not sexy enough, they're, you know, they're, they're women and everybody's gay. <laughs> so let's see, this is, uh, this is interesting because this is what my work is like now that I'm older, I'm, um, and I have a piece over there that's sort of like that, uh, trying to figure out what, how much, you know, dealing with being old and, and death and making friends with it. It says, how long will my allure last? And the skeleton with the clock. Here's one that says, even transgressive sex is boring. <laughs> and she's all tied up. <laughs> um, this was like, you know, responding to ads. I see ads of um, men saying, you know, I want a a housekeeper, a nurse, a cheerleader, or a maid. And you know this guy is like this horrible froggy guy, but you know, the woman and a nuclear physicist and, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> here's, you know, the French maid. Um, 
So then, uh, this is a self-portrait. It's called Sad, <laughs> when my husband left. Here's one praying, and it says, um, um, God answered my prayers. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> These are based on um, walrus and the carpenter, somehow I identified. <laughs> and okay, let's see where, how do we go back to, oh, here we are. So then, do you want to butt in at any point? Um, <laughs> Sarah? Well, just, just before we go to the next series, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, you, you've talked about the inherent contradiction of um, uh, sort of um, this idea of, of the difficulty perhaps of being a heterosexual woman. And you quote it in humor, mm -hmm. but there is a real poignancy yeah. in a lot of your work. Thank you. That, that is very generalized. So can you talk about when what came first, the poignancy or the, um, the humor to, to cite the chicken joke? Um, I guess I just felt like, you know, humor um, really sees two sides of a situation. And that's what humor is about. And um, so I, I felt like my ideas could be expressed without um, looking like I don't see both sides. I, like, um, it drives a point home and, um, you know. I mean, there, you know, the, the standard line about humor is you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Exactly. <laughs> and it, there is... But I think it's more than that. Um, I equate humor with intelligence. I mean, I'm not saying I'm m m trying to elevate myself that way, but I'm just saying um, I think they're the same thing because they're looking at things in a, in a way that um, reveals something. And Jonathan Swift... But there also is the idea of, you know, humor c can be a way in that's not so harsh and like you're saying. Um, Jonathan Swift, who wrote, obviously, Gulliver's Travels, his uh, tombstone reads righteous indignation. And I feel that that is something that really cuts to the quick of your work. Right. That, you know... It, Except for I find righteousness so horrible. <laughs> but but I, I think I think what it, I mean so did Swift. <laughs> but yeah. I mean the idea of yeah no of, he wouldn't have the, the idea of the indignation it, that that it is worth fighting for. The it's indignation. worth fighting for. Yeah, I mean I find my feminism. Yeah, it does get um, activated in the small small places. So that's something I'd like to talk about a little bit more. I mean, you grow, grew up and, and really were maturing as an artist in that moment of sort of feminism coming into art practices. Mm -hmm. um, was that something you were aware of early on? Or, yeah. I mean, because you were well, I'm not... I'm at an age where... Um, uh, yeah, we, we were. I was very deeply involved in second wave feminism in Berkeley. It was during the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War, and feminism. And I was in a women's group, and um, <clears throat> we. It was is the way I just contrast it with the way things are now, which um, we never wanted to be seen as victims. Never, never, never. The whole thing was empower. You know, we wanted to be powerful. Um, we were not victims, and even if we were, we we refused to see ourselves that way. And I sort of still have that attitude. 
And I think that attitude is in my work too. And um, what's my point? I had a point. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I had a further point about, you know, victimhood. I remember, yeah, we slept with our teachers. Um, and they, uh, those were the days when you did that. And, uh, and I must say, now they say, oh, that's so inequitable. The man has all the power. Uh-uh. I had the power, right, Shelly? <laughs> Oh, I heard her. I heard her. <laughs> we had the power, too. So, but, I mean, I remember we, we did ha hit on a lot of really great stuff, like um, in that kind of feminist quorum, we talked about crazy women, what a threat crazy women are. They're not like crazy men. They're, they're, they're really out of control. I mean, Mike Pence can't even be alone in the room with a woman. I mean... Because, you know, you can't contain women. They are, you know, when you take the top off, woo! <laughs> so, to push back slightly, because I, I think this is a really interesting point. Chris Krause, in her 90s kind of autobiographical novel, I Love Dick, she reflects back on her early career as an artist, and she talks about how she and I am forgetting who she did this with, they were reciting Hegel while stripping in strip clubs. And they felt that, you know, this was a statement. And they said at the same time, the That's theoreticians, the, 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 theoreticians <laughs> the male theoreticians of her generation were out there making careers. And reflecting back, 20 years after that, she felt she had been had. So while I agree with you about the innate power of women and femininity, I do want us to explore the limits of that. Yeah, I think I, 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 think I take that on too. I'd like to think I do. I mean, uh, yeah. And is that where the humor comes in? Probably. I mean, humor is always offensive and defensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and very, I think that's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not all aggressive and tender. I mean, I can show, like, then I, I, like I did these clown paintings. I was interested in, whoops, how did that happen? Oh. Yeah, this one is more about tenderness. It's not all anger and... This one is, is more about tenderness. These two. My models are here today. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, the journey from... And this is like, also, I, I sort of did these um, under the covers ones. Um, how do I get this to there? Um, I did these uh, during the Trump times when I felt like the world was so awful. We just had to like fortify ourselves and you know get under the covers and make a you know hide almost. <laughs> this is so, a work so which it's, it's is not. There. Yeah, I have one of those. Uh, from that show there, and they're not um, so much about fighting. <laughs> I, when I look at that work, what I see is also your love of what you do. I mean, well, I you. think... Yeah, I, I want to yeah, make clear I'm not just a polemic. No, no, of course, but I know, yeah. when I look at the way you paint the covers, mm -hmm. It seems to me that there is an excitement, an obsession, a delight in being able to render that. Very much so. And also, this, was, this work had to do with uh, referencing um, a long tradition of artists painting um, drapery. drapery, which, um, you know, I can't say that I, I, you know, I tried my best, but there's some genius, you know, bring me to my knees, paintings of drapery, you know, you know, 
by uh, Renaissance. Even in the 19th century. 19th century, Angra, oh my God, the way he painted silk yeah. and skin, oh, so fabulous, the beauty of the, those paintings. So it would seem to me that, that in this moment of turmoil, um, there is great solace for you yeah, in the physicality that, of what I you did, do. I do, do have both things going on. I wanted to see the couple as, um, as solace and tenderness as well as, you know. Um, and basically, you know, I use sex more as a metaphor for life than a biological, I'm not interested in the biological thing so much. I'm interested in it as representing something. This might be a good segue to focus. I mean, you've shown one, but um, some of your series which are about aging, oh, the okay. details of which, again, are just sumptuous. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, Sherry told me how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so here I am in the in the tub with some martini. Okay, this one's called Cheers. <laughs> in the tub with a skeleton, having some martinis. And this one, how do I do this? Oh, there we go. Okay, this one's called Don't Skimp on the Foreplay. <laughs> It's just, um, I'm, you know, I'm going to go down trying. <laughs> Hell to that. <laughs> um, do you want to do another one? Yeah. Oh, then there's... Well, we, we'll have to rely on words. Language, that's okay. the problem. And then? Judy, can you talk about your process? I mean, obviously, <clears throat> you know, the... Well, you know, um, I just love painting. It's, um, I see it as an all or nothing process. You go in your studio and you're completely involved. It's like cavemen. In, it's all or nothing. You could easily fail, and you usually do. And um, I find that so thrilling and wonderful. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't get into contemporary format, you know, of technology, because I just love the, the, the all involving. And these are watercolors which I um, have done a lot of watercolors and I really like it because it has a certain sensuality and a ethereal, like, they don't seem so permanent. They just seem like they just sort of drifted in. Um, I'm trying to do more oil paintings, which is even more process oriented, I think. I mean, like they sit in my studio, it's very exciting. They're like this live thing that sits there and I, I leave them there for a long time, and um, I see, oh, you know, that should be blue, not pink, and um, it's a living, throbbing thing. It's hard to match in any other form. You know, I mean, like, I, I go to travel. I, I don't, I, there's nothing like traveling in my studio, in my head. I mean, there's a lot of artists here. I'm sure they feel the same way. Um, can you talk about color? Because I think one of the really extraordinary things about your work is how color comes into play, especially when you visit similar themes and it's the colors that change, which change the way the work looks. 
Yeah, let me think. What do I say about color? Um, it's more about light. And then the color serves the light. It's not like I think so much about tone. I think about light. And so it could be a light green, could be, you know, um, which is, I guess I get that from Matisse. Yeah. Um, and I guess Matisse got it from Delacroix and <laughs> um, on and on. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you like the color. It's, yeah, it's sort of, it's very organic. I, I don't make specific choices. I, it, yeah, like I said, it's more about the light. I, I think what we have here on the screen, I find very interesting, because you've obviously got the great lusciousness of the way you're painting the skin. But then you have the really strong line and drawing of the skeleton. And I think that that's something really delicate and something really right. interesting. I'm glad you feel that way, because that's what I wanted. This is actually inspired by a sergeant drawing called Whispers, which I just love this drawing. I, it drove me crazy. And I, there's something about whispering that seems so intimate and um, wonderful. That, inspired me to, and it almost looks like, you know, they're whispering something pretty profound. <laughs> so as I mentioned, you have a work up right now at the parish mm -hmm. in the Artist Choose Artist mm -hmm. uh, series of exhibitions. And it's an abstract work. Right. And I would really love for you to kind of talk about your abstract work and then the transition into what right. you do now. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I've been an abstract painter for a long time, and um, I very much would like to continue that thread. And uh, you know, I, I hope I can pull it into my. I haven't abandoned it. I do a lot of wallpaper, of you know, and uh, I would like to continue to have both things going. Um, I love abstract painting. Um, I uh, had this urgency to do the subject matter, like I said, from some, some crisis that happened in my life uh, gave me this urgency. But um, I hope I can uh, pull more of my abstract work into my figurative work and vice versa. It, it would seem to me, and, and this may be a step too far, that it is in the color and your mm -hmm. use of color mm -hmm. and that interest in the light, which kind of unites both of these parts of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, um, this has, you can't really see, let's see. This work I did to sort of marbleize, hand mar. it's too faint. It's all marbleized. Does the other one have it better? Anyway, um, I'm yeah, I'm trying to, uh, Pull that in. Uh, the other one, the foreplay one. No, that does, doesn't show it. Well, you can sort of see, you know. I marbleized the paper before I started. Gives it of a, yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I don't want to do an illustration. I, I want the paint to have a, um, have uh, you know some kind of presence in the work and 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 have it transcend somewhat from just an app illustration of an idea um, I don't really I get I mean I could find one but that's okay Another <laughs> I guess you could, I could, if you go back to that, let's see, I could find a... Um, oh no, you don't want to see my email. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's <was> pretty funny. <laughs> As I said, this is an experiment. Thank you for being patient with That's us. Some. Um, yeah, maybe under here. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. 
Yeah, that one I'm not that, here I have, as you can see, I did all this wallpaper that I'm kind of excited about. Okay, computer died. Okay, we so <laughs> what, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions, but before we do that, I have one last question, okay. which is, in a very abstract way, there is autobiography in your work. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not tying it down too much. I'd like to no, have no. Some, a somewhat universal, I don't want some vain thing about, here I am, you know. But, but I, I, I think one of the things that gives your work so much power is the fact that it comes from a very deeply held and strong place mm -hmm. within you. Mm -hmm. So uh, exactly the point that you just made, what is that balance between the personal and the universal? Well, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna name drop. Um, I remember, you know, I actually knew Toni Morrison s sort of, I mean, I had dinner with her six or seven times, and when you have dinner with her, it's a big deal. I mean, it's very intense. She, she's not just sitting there cutting the meat. And um, <laughs> she, you know, I said, why do I respond to your work? I mean, I, I have nothing in common. And she said, well, the more local you are, the more universal you are. And um, yeah, because it's true. Uh, she's not the first to say that. No, but. You just said it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you. That's a huge compliment. And with that, let's open it up to questions. But I also hope that, yeah, it does have some resonance. Sure. And I don't try not to show my face too much because I, I want it to be not about me. Questions? Oh. Rima. I gotta say thank you. Oh my God, my friends are so cool. I can't believe you showed up on 1030. <laughs> this is so sweet. I can, I'm so moved. Uh, Judy, I really like your work a lot. But thank you. when I see it, I keep thinking of Egon Schiele because the timing is sort of similar historically, and we were talking about despair and Trump, and the sense of abandonment or powerlessness of femininity. But when I look at it, I love so much that it's abstract, and then there is the strong drawing, and there is sex, which is okay. life, but then there's also the death, the destruction, the dream part, and I really think I'm actually wondering if Egon Schiele was inspiring Oh, you. God, I worship him. Okay, that's... Uh, yeah, and I do look at that work, and uh, yeah, I'm busted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really like it a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Question. The way he lays it in, on the paper is just so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. I, do you take photographs, uh, work from photographs, and do you project the photographs to outline the figures and the folds and stuff like that before you paint? Um, uh, like a third of the time I do that. And um, <laughs> I have done that, and I then I get lazy. I don't really like working that way because the, the painting's not really there with you. But I have done that when I have trouble laying it out. Yeah, I do work from photographs, but I change the photographs quite a bit. And um, I somehow, I sometimes have outlined them, yeah, with projection, but usually I don't anymore. I used to do that more. Nada and, and Taylor. Sorry. I am very taken by the color in your uh, paintings, and I'm very curious. For me, they have another message. How do you, when you do draw, when you draw, and you, do, how strong you're aware of the colors? Because for me, colors are telling the story as much as your drawings. Interesting. Because the, the way you choose the colors, they're very unique. I'm, I'm, thank you so much for saying that. Um, 
Yeah, it's a big decision. You know, every time you put on a different color, it's a big decision. I, I'm not sure I can really describe how I do it, or wh what leads me to, except for, like I said, the light and the, let me think. <laughs> how do I? You know, I did a, a, a show called Fur and Flesh. I love the color of flesh, and I love to paint that color. And uh, I like that, not just in f on the flesh, but in the um, background, too. I like to use that color. I had a show where I painted the walls flesh color. Um, Your flesh is that flesh has each artist has different nuance of a flesh, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. yours is Dumb very light. unique to you. For me, oh, that's thank it. you. It's usually darker. Or I really get into it. I have to say, I really get into the flesh tones. I mean, that, that's the most fun. One of the most fun parts. Bill Taylor and then Mary Jane. First, uh, what I totally get is your universe set. Universal oh, oh, thank you. message in your <laughs> paintings because I mean I remember walking into your studio and how brave I thought you were when you painted the picture of the ass. <laughs> I was just and I knew what you were going through and I was just like you know you, the strength that comes through your paintings for all thank women. You. I mean because it's an experience that many people have but can't articulate the emotional turmoil it throws somebody right. into and it is a death but what i want to know and like, how you shouldn't yeah how behaving does not serve you well no that's <laughs> it being a good girl well it it's just a shock yeah. you know to wake up to who you really are but what i am curious about because i love cross cultural of all arts and i'm wondering if there's a symmetry that you address when you're doing your paintings because I know like with music you know you're like verse chorus bridge verse you know you're creating a certain kind of tapestry do you approach your paintings with a certain kind of symmetry I got to hit a b a b c does that come up yeah that's interesting um Definitely. I mean, I do feel like every inch of a painting has to be animated. I don't know whether that's what you're talking about something else. Yeah, there's so many things. You, you, you don't want it, you want it to be like visually get the point across. You want it to be visually exciting you want it and the, so you have to have it alive somehow bring it out and make it alive um so you're t you're thinking of all these different is that what you mean yeah, like a, balance. a balance yeah 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 oh yeah i was talking about how sheely lays it on the page somehow he just does it so it, it's just right the way he does that and uh, yeah I do think of that and um, like I said it, you can't like ignore any square inch of the surface it all has to be alive or taking a back seat so the other part will be alive I don't think I answered very well, but I'm interested in your ideas about music. <laughs> but symmetry is like an, a very beautiful thing to think about. I just wanted to go back to color, Nada's question, Judy, because just to remind you that <laughs> I mean I see the influence of your love of textile and pattern and. I mean, you're just crazy about it, and then, it really, of course, you really do it in your wallpaper. Right. But I see that palette in your work, that, you know, which is palettes, like you're not afraid to embrace palettes from another cu culture, let's say. Yeah, yeah. You know. um, well, color, you know, works as a sensual. It's like what pulls, you know, it's, if you want a painting to seduce you, 
one of the ways you can do it is with color. And yeah, you go to India, it's like the most seductive place in the world. I'd like to address uh, something you said earlier, which was your relationship between figuration and abstraction, non-objective work, you know. And I don't think there's a painter who doesn't struggle with that. We certainly have endless discussions over lunches and things like that, right. my painter friends. But you know, while you were saying that, it occurred to me that perhaps for a photographer, uh, that debate that you have between abstract, non-objective, or figurative mm -hmm. uh, would be black and white or color. And mm -hmm. it's, it's essentially the, the intended results that count. You know, what are you ultimately trying to say? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to examine that further, but the other thing about that Sheila observation, which I can see how your, you know, the transparency, edge, things like that are, are similar, but I was comparing his results to yours, which are just 180 opposite. Oh, I good. Mean, yeah. what, what you say is so different from, from his intention, in, in my opinion. Yeah. I relinquish the mic. <laughs> I, I mean, it's interesting that you're sort of bringing up uh, two points. One of them is I'm struggling with abstract work and figurative work. But in my in figurative work, you want it to be have an work as an abstract painting as well as a figurative. You want it to transcend the subject matter and be a visual experience that isn't just an illustration. I mean, you look at you know, Rembrandt, and it's an abstract painting. You know, the whole thing is abstract because it sort of transcends somehow. But then you look at the way he paints hands and they're like Monet. <laughs> but I mean, I'm talking more about the whole thing. But that, yeah, that's another issue. Like, does the work transcend to a new abstract quality? I hope, I hope so, but then I also did purely abstract work that I'm trying to, so there's two things going on anyway. Sherry? <laughs> Thanks, Judy. I have a question. Um, my question is to see if you might uh, speak a little bit about vulnerability as both the depiction of vulnerability as well as how it feels for you because you are, in the last few years, using yourself often, as we can see here, unclothed, um, and then from the perspective of the content, also exploring the vulnerability of the human experience vis-a-vis -vis sex as a metaphor. I think, um, yeah, that's very key in my work, vulnerability. And I think <clears throat> that's why sex is an interesting subject matter, because it's inherent. And it's also what I'm talking about somewhat with power, like, can you like take the power and not just be vulnerable? Even though you are vulnerable, can you take the chance? You know, I, I think that's an important part of uh, any work about sex or any work about human beings. And how does it feel for you to put yourself, literally put yourself out there? Um, it felt somewhat liberating. Um, and a way of dealing with vulnerability, actually. I, like, uh, you know, feel somewhat empowered when I do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But then, um, you know, the life of an artist is one day you think, wait till they see this. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on the cover of the New York Times that people are going to be on their knees. The next day, you are this... I, I made such a fool of myself. <laughs> it's like those two things go hand in hand. <laughs> it's beautifully expressed. And then we have a lot of people responding to that. <laughs> Let's go to your daughter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, my question is going to be more leading the witness here, but um, <laughs> I just wonder in the clown uh, imagery, um, the actual 
textiles that you source and have us put on for you, I, especially the shoes. There's something about the shoes when I look at them that feels so vulnerable to me, the way that they were so carefully constructed. Is there something in the, on the note of vulnerability with clowns that you... That's so interesting. I don't know why the shoes bring that out. <laughs> they're, they're such a beautiful piece of art, I think, these shoes. But um, why do they make me feel that way, you know? And I guess... There's something that, you know, that, that's what grounds you in humanity and then somebody's trying to make a statement about it. I don't know. <laughs> Just to clarify, she buys the clown clothes that were made by clowns in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, and, I love and those they're outfits. they're so beautifully constructed by these. I love those outfits. And um, yeah, the, I, I, I always cite the movie Children of Paradise. Um, where they had this beautiful clown um, with the pom-poms. I love that, and the collar is so fabulous. And it's also sort of trans, like it's men wearing these flowing, beautiful clothes. That, um, and I actually read a book about clowns um, from Barnum and Bailey in the 30s, and um, it did say they were, um, it was a homosexual community which fascinated me because it is kind of a, a, a form of drag, you know, to get all that beautiful makeup on and everything. And of course, you don't see any women clowns. And um, I did look it up, and a woman clown is called a clunt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, you know... <laughs> Well, especially in the Children of Paradise, I mean, that yeah. juxtaposition between a clown and a beautiful woman. And a clown and a beautiful woman, yeah. And the impossibility of that love. Yeah. I mean, it's deeply and they embedded love, in the and trope. that movie is so poignant. And that character, and they're all sort of archetypes in that movie. It's so beautiful, yeah. yeah. Made in the, um, I guess, in the Nazi, when the Nazis had taken... Just before. Yeah. Came out during... Yeah. I, uh, I'd like to get your permission to tell the story I told you this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As I came here. Is, it, yes. would, is that all right? It, it's my subject matter. I know. That's why I want to tell it. <laughs> I went to uh, the garden center down the street to buy a saucer. And uh, this woman, to mid-40s, goes out with me, we find the saucer, she comes dancing, prancing back to the cash register. She's singing, she's writing me up, singing, etc. And I said, God, you're so happy. And she said, I got laid last night. <laughs> and, and then she said, he was 12 years younger. She said, I thought I was never gonna get laid again. You gotta love this town, man. I mean, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it sort of speaks in a real way to the liberation that I think all of us, but you know, you yeah, spoke directly to. Yeah. Well, you know, when I first did the sex advice drawings, I, people were actually sort of like, shocked might not be a strong enough word, but they were like, oh, gee. And um, I mean, maybe too strong a word, sorry. But things, because there was no Amy Schumer, there was no, um, you know, what's her name? That other, Alina Dunham. 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 There was no, um, I can't think of her name. Anyway, female comics. Oh, Sarah Silverman, uh, yeah. did you say? It, Chelsea Handler. Chelsea Handler, the Sarah whole great Silverman. Generation. They, Amy weren't, um, they weren't Margaret around Cho, then. We've had, they yeah. weren't around then. Women were not allowed to be vulgar. And um, so that interested me. And um, I backed off from that because it's impossible to shock now. Mm. I mean. <laughs> yeah, the bar is certainly pretty high. Yeah, shock. the bar is it's way too high. high for me. Too high for me, too. <laughs> I mean, get that. Any I think there's one yeah. more question behind you. Please. Thank you. 
Uh, when you were talking about transgression and the role of women, it struck me that if you'd been born 300 years earlier, around here, you'd probably be burned at the stake burned as, as, a, as a witch. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Yeah. And what might be Well, the... it's coming back again. They are. They are. That's I mean, what now I'm Now we asking. have thought What's police. You're not allowed to say. Yeah, if you go to Florida, we wouldn't you be able to have this You can't say the word gay? Yeah, we, we don't have to look too far. I mean, yeah, women are making a lot of progress and, make, and going backwards and forward. I mean, it's interesting. That I'm hoping that young people will change everything. I think every generation feels that way. Let's hope so. That <laughs> they won't let this, this go on. One hopes. Well, Sorry. Judy, we can only thank you for <laughs> allowing us to have this conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. You know, I had so many, like, profound things to say, and it just degenerated into... <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you were plenty profound for a my Sunday list, morning. My list did not include... <laughs> It was all Eric's fault throwing us off with that Eric's anecdote fault. this morning. <laughs> but is there a word of wisdom you would like to leave us all with, Judy? Oh, wow. Judy, I, I, is there a word of wisdom no, you'd like to I leave us all with? I can't think of anything. <laughs> I don't have any wisdom. I'm, yeah, well, I'm just trying my best, I think. Uh, we'll come back and see. Uh, and when somebody, Juno Barnes, asked Joyce what his work was about, and he said, just want to describe what it's like to be human. Isn't that good? <laughs> Please come back and see Judy's work in our next show, along with many, many other wonderful artists. And thank you for being here this morning.